Good morning and welcome to the June edition of Psychotech Talk. My name is Kaya Sotola, your presenter today. And today I'm joined by a fellow homeboy from KZN, Sizigwala, who is the project director for public sector at the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants. Good morning to you, Sizi. Good morning, Kaya. How are you doing? Well, it's a bit cold, but here <laughs> we know. are. And I think today I'm actually quite excited in the type of topics we're going to cover. We do have our regular in terms of the tax updates, but also quite interestingly, the Reserve Bank is going to be giving us some interesting information about the developments in the policy and regulation side. So that's something I'm actually quite interested to look forward to. Certainly, I'm actually interested in that IESBA strategy to find out what they're doing in the coming years. Yeah, I think also one of the more interesting developments that we've been tracking since around February is what's happening in the CIPC. I think the type of changes that we're expecting to see from them and the implications for the country's quest to get out of grey listing means that it's going to remain firmly on our agenda for the remainder of the year. And I'd like to obviously hear today what the new developments are, particularly on the question of beneficial ownership, where Juanita has given us insights before and it left me a bit concerned about how far the process is. I think we all concerned about where South Africa finds itself and probably how we're going to get out of this place. Yeah. And of course, to you as members, we definitely want you to keep engaging. And as you can see through the chat box, I see we've sorted out the sound gremlins. You can post questions and throughout the morning, we will be passing on those questions to our various presenters. And of course, we'd also like to get some ideas on what you want us to cover in future sessions of the monthly Tech Talk. We'll probably be back to our Thursday session next month because I think a lot of people have become familiar with the Thursday morning date for this month. We had to move it a bit because there is a particular event happening tomorrow where a lot of members will also be participating. Of course, CPD points is the type of thing that we all like to have. And keep in mind that the deadline is, what, tomorrow? Yes. 30th of June for yes. those that haven't done their CPD. I'm as guilty as some of you, so I'll be sorting that out this afternoon. So please make sure that you get all that sorted. And on that note, I are we ready for our first presentation? Let's go on ahead, Kaya, and introduce our first speaker. And of course, Somea usually is much later, but today I think she wanted to wake up a bit early. So Somea Kaki is, of course, our regular tech guru who gives us important insights on a monthly basis on what's happening on the operational and tax administration side. She is indeed responsible for all of those engagements that SICA members have and the interactions that we have with SARS. Somea, good morning to you and take it away for the June update. Good morning, Kaya and I'm Susie. Kaya, I think uh, it was before your time that I actually used to be the first speaker. Welcome back to your original start. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, let me uh, go through the or if it's affecting members, but I'm sure we'll hear all about it in the chat. It's stopped now, though, so hopefully uh, that's it for now. Okay, so just in terms of what's been happening uh, in the tax admin and ops space over the last few weeks, I think what's on everybody's mind right now is the upcoming filing season and, you know, what's happening there, what changes have come, what the relevant dates are in respect of that. I've also just included um, some important SARS communication and guides that members need to be aware of just to make sure you don't miss this, as well as highlighting some of the other SARS ops and tax admin matters that are not dealt with um, in, in terms of the other topics. And we just had a meeting with SARS, uh, national stakeholder team yesterday, actually. So that was all the recognized controlling bodies that met with SARS and we got some feedback on some of the issues that we raised. Just to note to members that the feedback summary um, for the discussions arising in that SARS meeting will be shared in the mailer later this week, tomorrow actually. So for now, I will just be highlighting uh, just a few of those uh, points from that meeting and, and based on what we raised with SARS. But to go into the 2023 filing season, for whoever missed it, the commencement date of filing season for the current year is the 7th July. 
and SARS have noted that taxpayers or practitioners can actually start working on the system from about or just after 8 p.m. on the 7th of July. And the reason why we have a later start date this year, uh, according to SARS, is in order to accommodate the issuing of auto assessments and make sure that all the pre-population that needs to happen does actually happen before taxpayers and practitioners start working on the returns. I've just added a caution in here that you shouldn't start filing early. So some taxpayers or practitioners may have noticed that some of the returns have already been pre-populated and are available on e-filing. Those are your auto-assessed returns. But SARS have cautioned uh, taxpayers and noted that you shouldn't assume that that is ready for filing because there may still be further pre-population that does need to take place uh, based on where SARS is in the process of pre-populating those returns. So we will, uh, yeah, we, we are just cautioning members as well not to file early, to rather wait, because what we saw in prior years is that in some instances, um, tax practitioners assume that their clients would not be subject to auto-assessment because on the 1st of July, those auto-assessed returns were not available, and they started requesting returns for those clients only to have SARS issue auto assessments a few days later, which resulted in manual interventions in most instances which delayed the assessments. SARS have said that that won't happen this year in that um, taxpayers who are subject to auto assessment won't be able to actually still request returns. Um, up until the 7th of July. So everybody will have to wait for that date in any event. Um, if you do want to start working on or editing the returns, apparently that is possible, but I would say rather wait until the launch, uh, until the actual commencement of filing season to avoid losing any changes if there are any updates that do come through uh, before the 7th. And in terms of the filing uh, deadlines, the dates are the same or similar as with the prior year. So we've got the 23rd of October, 2023 being the filing deadline for your non-provisional taxpayers. And that includes trusts uh, who are filing on e-filing and uh, taxpayers who are unable to file online may do so at a SARS branch by appointment. With respect to the auto-assessed taxpayers, one of the positive changes this year is that they will have an automatic extension to edit those auto-assessed returns until the 23rd of October. So what happened in the prior year is that those auto-assessed taxpayers had 40 days within which to edit the return, but now you've actually got more time to do that until the 23rd of October. And SARS will be issuing a fact sheet to all auto-assessed taxpayers, so they will be sending a letter the same way they did it last year, and that letter will explain what the auto-assessment is and, and how you actually uh, need to deal with that when you agree or disagree with the content of that auto-assessment. With respect to provisional taxpayers, including trusts, um, where they are, where they do fit the definition of provisional taxpayer, the deadline for these uh, taxpayers will be the 24th of January 2024. Okay, with respect to the uh, payment due dates, so SARS in the past for I'm not sure how many years it was, but the last couple of years at the very least, they allowed a, a, due, a payment due date up to the 31st of January for taxpayers and you wouldn't have incurred any interest. But SARS is now strictly applying the payment due dates and they've noted that for non-provisional e-filers, um, in respect of taxpayers who are not auto-assessed, the payment due date will be 30 days after a notice of assessment has been issued. And with respect to the auto-assessed taxpayers, the payment due date will be 30 days post the 2023 filing season closing date. 
And then with respect to uh, form updates for individuals, SARS did share a lot of detail on this in a letter that Saika shared in the Integrity Tax Weekly Mailer last week, but I do have links in here as well. Uh, so SARS noted that with respect to foreign income, so, so taxpayers who are earning foreign income, SARS have now included three different fields to accommodate the different scenarios that these taxpayers may find themselves faced with. And you can read that detail in the letter that was shared. And with respect to spouses who are married in community of property, SARS notes that for this filing season, they have retrieved this information from the prior year's returns, and they've cross-checked it with the Department of Home Affairs. So where spouses were successfully matched and they've got interest income, so it's limited to interest income for now, SARS will replicate the relevant certificate on both spouses' returns and each spouse will be taxed 50% on assessment. So that I think from a SARS perspective is to make sure that uh, the income is taken into account in the relevant, in both spouses' uh, tax returns and assessments. Just some points to note, and we did share a lot of material on this in the prior year, but members who still want to have a look at that, let us know. Otherwise, have a look on the SICA website. If you navigate to resources tax, um, and this should be under either guidance or tax alert, you'll, you will see some of the information that we shared here in terms of what circumstances a trust may be a non-provisional taxpayer. And I just want to point out here as well, it's not just in respect of trusts, but also individual taxpayers where you have registered for the provisional tax type on e-filing. This does not necessarily mean that uh, the taxpayer does fit the definition of a provisional taxpayer. You have to check the status each year. Even if SARS had noted on a statement of account that the taxpayer was a provisional taxpayer, don't necessarily rely on that because we did uh, see quite a few instances at the beginning of this year and last year following the change in the penalty rules where SARS is now imposing a penalty for one or more late return or outstanding return, um, where uh, a person who thinks they are a provisional taxpayer only files by the 24th of January the following year, and SARS finds out on assessment that they are actually not a provisional taxpayer. Uh, SARS would then impose a penalty in that regard. So it's very important to check. Now, with respect to this, you would note on the first slide, I mentioned that for auto-assessed taxpayers, SARS was, you know, or has granted that automatic assessment for those taxpayers to edit and submit their returns by the 23rd of October. We did request that SARS consider an extension or allowing requests for extensions on the system for your taxpayers who are not sure yet whether they're provisional or non-provisional and the taxpayers obviously need a bit of time to determine that status because you know, previously it was if two or more returns were late, then you get a penalty. Now it's one or more, so the implications are, are, are um, you know, more, more imminent now. If you if you're late with just this one return, then you've got this problem. So we we did request some sort of extension or leniency uh, in the meeting that we had with SARS yesterday. It was something that we had put on the agenda again. SARS did indicate that they would not be making any such uh, blanket extension. They felt that in prior years, tax practitioners abused. Um, the availability of extensions by sending lists of their clients to SARS for whom they wanted to request extensions. So SARS did say that in terms of the relevant law, if there are um, provisions that allow for the uh, requesting of extensions, then taxpayers or practitioners would just need to follow the normal process in respect of that, but there will not be any functionality on e-filing for this. But SARS did acknowledge our concerns and say that they understand the background and, and the reason why we're requesting this from a provisional versus non-provisional taxpayer perspective where you've got these taxpayers who are, you know, borderline and you need to check their status each year. So they said that they will discuss further in terms of the penalties that are imposed in this regard and they will give us feedback once they have had uh, the opportunity to engage. 
One of the other issues that came up is that in the trust letter, you'll see the link is on the next slide, SARS noted that they want trusts to submit as part of their supporting documents all minutes of all trustee meetings held for the year. And we were not sure if um, you know, SARS really wanted everything or they only wanted those minutes where vesting decisions were taken. So this was also raised at the meeting with SARS yesterday and the national stakeholder team said that they would get back to us after discussing with the relevant teams at SARS to make sure um, they communicate exactly what it is that's required. But the concern around this is obviously, and, and SARS has raised this before, that in some instances with some trusts, there is backdating of um, minutes to record certain vesting decisions or distributions, et cetera, that were taken after year in. And SARS wants to make sure that these meetings are actually taking place during the course of the year and that adequate records are being kept in that regard. But once we get further information from SARS, that will be shared with members. With respect to trusts, again, the third party reporting, that due date remains the 30th of September for reporting on the period from 1 March 2022 to 28 February 2023. I did note previously to members, uh, I think in a tech talk or tax in practice, that given Given the due date being the end of September, that information will not be used to pre-populate relevant beneficiaries' returns. However, SARS will use that information to validate whatever is disclosed in a trust beneficiary returns to make sure that um, all that information matches. But just to note then to members that you must just be mindful of filing a return before the third party data has been submitted to SARS, because once they receive that information, it may result in queries at the later stage, which could result in delays in finalization of the assessment. You could possibly uh, complete everything in there and then just wait to submit until that information is uh, sent through but obviously being mindful of being compliant in terms of the deadlines. Okay, and then I mentioned that I was sharing links to important uh, communication and guides. So I have included in here the 2023 notice to file returns. Pitt will be covering that next week in quite a bit of detail in the tax in practice session that's taking place on Thursday, the 6th of July. So if you haven't yet registered for that, I, I would encourage you um, to register every month, in fact. But if you are particularly interested in this, then please do register so you can get more insight into the detail on that notice. Um, the SARS webpage on the 2023 filing season does also include quite a bit of detail uh, that you might want to make yourself familiar with and send to your clients as well so that they can understand the process and the work that you need to do. Important to note here with respect to the auto assessments, it's still the responsibility of the taxpayer to make sure that all the information populated in that auto assessment is accurate and complete. So it would be important to alert your clients to that if they do receive an auto assessment, if they are auto assessed by SARS, they shouldn't just assume that everything in there is 100% accurate. There may be certain information that didn't pre-populate correctly or the third parties didn't send it through or there's additional information that SARS was not aware of, additional income or allowances that were not taken into account that your clients then need to have their returns edited for. Um, so, so please make them aware of their responsibilities in that regard. And if I remember correctly, so as does um, note it in the communication that they share as well, in terms of whose responsibility it is to make sure that the information is correct. And then the trust tax returns and system changes. There is a link here to the SARS letter that we did share in the mailer last week. Please have a look at that. SARS also shared a comprehensive guide to completing the trust return, as well as a trust return e-filing guide that uh, you may want to have a look through. And then the personal income tax filing season updates, I did highlight some of these in um, one of the prior slides. So more 
detail in terms of those changes and other changes as well are included in this letter that I've linked. And then I've also linked the SARS personal income tax e-filing guide. And what has just come through late last week is a SARS guide to completing the ITR 14. SARS also shared a letter with RCBs late last week. It was too late for the mailer last week, but we are including it in the mailer that's coming out tomorrow. Please will you have a look at that. So every year SARS does update the ITR 14 um, just to take into account legislative changes that came through last year that are effective in respect of the 2023 year. So please take note of that. I did if I recall correctly, I did mention in a previous session as well as in the summary in one of, one of the mailers that due to these updates that only come through close to commencement of filing season, it's always a good idea to wait to file um, a, a return just in case, you know, when the new return comes out, I think that the information that you've saved possibly disappears and you have to capture that again. Obviously, too, too late now, but um, we did alert members to that. And then just to note that SARS did give practitioners the opportunity to test both the new uh, personal income tax returns as well as the new ITR 14. For the ITR 14, that testing took place on Saturday, the 24th of June. And I've seen from a couple of members that they did identify some issues, which they then communicated to SARS and SARS is working on, on fixing and addressing that. And then just to note also the SARS PAYE administrative penalties um, update letter that has also come out, also shared in the mailer, but if you missed it, the link is here. Okay, so something's happened with um, the top part of this slide. I'm not sure what exactly it is, but hopefully it's come through on the pack that you have received. Um, if I can remember correctly, for the second part of this, what, uh, you, you know, the screenshot that I've highlighted in here is something that's been coming through in the last few days, I would think. Um, members are sending this through and saying that their clients or if it's members in business, uh, then, then they, as the tax person um, at that entity, have been receiving these emails from SARS, where SARS is basically requesting a rough estimate of what uh, the VAT liability would be for the current period in respect of that taxpayer. SARS does note that they only want a very rough estimate in this regard. And they, the reason they need this information excuse me, is because they need to provide it to the commissioner, the SARS commissioner and the minister of finance to review future revenue received from the taxpayers on a monthly basis. So this is something that we raised with SARS at the meeting yesterday as well. And SARS indicated that these letters are most likely being sent only to large business taxpayers by the large business relationship manager. Um, According to SARS, this has been happening for a number of years now, uh, given the economic conditions in the countries. Uh, Treasury just wants to determine uh, the cash flows on a monthly basis so that that can be better managed. And this is the reason they asked for this information. There's obviously um, no obligation as such to say in, in terms of the law to send this to SARS, but SARS would appreciate this information and, you know, says that in the spirit of cooperation between these large businesses and SARS, they do expect um, to get some information in this regard, but they say that taxpayers, if, if there's any concerns in terms of what information is being shared or time uh, limitations, et cetera, and sharing the information, then the taxpayer or the tax practitioner must please engage the relevant SARS relationship manager to discuss concerns in this regard. So some of you may have already been seeing this in respect of your clients, so it comes as no, as no surprise. But obviously for those who raised it, it's the first time that they are seeing it, which is the reason why they, they did bring it up. Okay, and then some of the other issues that uh, were raised that we tried to get feedback on is that the request for reasons fu uh, functionality on e-filing doesn't seem to be working. It's not clear why this is the case. Um, 
we were wondering at first if it could be that the assessment that you're trying to dispute is a section 95 1a or c assessment we covered this in a lot of detail before so we a return hasn't been submitted or information hasn't been submitted on time and then this assessment is not subject to dispute and you've got to submit that return or submit the outstanding information and request a reduced return in that regard um, but SARS is investigating this and they said that they will as a matter of urgency try to resolve the issue try to identify what is causing this and resolve the issue so we did um, remind SARS that we need this to be sorted out quite quickly and another issue with respect to dispute functionality what uh, a couple of members have noted is that where they've got a penalty assessment on a taxpayer and they request remission of that penalty, let's say in respect of the same taxpayer, they receive an additional assessment, not a penalty assessment. So on the normal tax, if I can call it that, they have tried to lodge a dispute in that regard and the system blocks them from doing that on the basis that there's already a dispute in place. So that's another issue that SARS is investigating and we're hoping that they can give us some feedback quite quickly uh, for that. And then we've been receiving complaints from members that they are their clients are receiving penalty assessments for prior year returns that they were not obligated to submit. That's another thing that SARS is investigating. Examples were sent through. SARS couldn't identify any patterns in that regard or any systemic error, but they will continue looking at the examples there. So in this case, we have proposed that SARS adjust the dispute form to allow for one to just tick on the form that you know a return was not required for that year and explain the circumstances there. But we'll have to wait and see if they can um, update the form for that type of uh, functionality. And then in respect of the third party data reporting for trusts, I noted the deadline for that reporting. But what concerns us and is something that we've raised with SARS is that the testing for this was supposed to actually take place as early as April this year. That's now been postponed to the period between 14 August to 8 September. And then submission for this will only start taking place from the 18th of September. So a very, very short time frame here. Uh, which we are quite concerned about. As far as I'm aware, the public notice as well for with respect to this um, reporting hasn't yet been released. So I said that that should come out uh, soon. But, you know, the concerns that we have here have been raised with SARS and we're constantly engaging with them on that. And then one of the other points to note is, you know, a lot of members are complaining about the issues with the contact center. SARS did, did indicate that they are are understaffed there and they are looking at getting more resources. And I'm not sure of um, the source of all those resources, but there will be additional resources added for the filing season. And then one of the other SARS regions was talking about reallocation of resources from the service center to the contact center. And we were concerned about how that would impact um, the services that are then provided from an appointment perspective or branch perspective. So SARS did say that they would be speaking to the relevant teams to give us more insight as to what is happening there and how it will actually affect members. So that's it from me. I think my time is up for Tech Talk this morning as well. I will just go back to the studio. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Somaya. I think obviously with the filing season uh, looming, a lot of members will definitely take much value from this particular conversation. And I'm trying to look at some of the questions that are there. There's a remarkably difficult question about a particular branch of SARS that doesn't seem to be providing services as members would expect. So maybe you can address that one on the particular platform. There's one from Mike that says, will a natural person qualify for apportionment of section six rebates before and after the period that he, she ceases to be a non-resident in the tax year? And if not, why not? I don't know if you can give us some insights on that. I will, Akaya, I will rather look at that query on the chat to make sure that I fully understand what exactly the member is asking. 
All right, no, that's fine. And I think, yeah, the rest of the questions are the type of questions that you'll be able to address there on the chat. So the members will be able to read some of those responses. So thank you very much, Sumeya. And from the good parts on telling us what to do, Pete is about to tell us the consequences of not doing things the right way. So Pete Nell joins us. He's also from the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants and is about to take us through the objection process. And I'm hoping, Sisi, you're not going to fall foul of that. <laughs> no, Kaya, I'm not the kind of person. You uh, well behaved. You well behaved. <laughs> Pete, good morning to you. Take it away. Good morning, Kaya. Um, Sisi, the problem is that um, more of us and more tax taxpayers than tax practitioners of objection. So just to set the scene, one would submit a return, and I'll just bring up the two ones, the income tax return for individuals or for companies. Um, you submit the return and automatically the SAR system will generate a notice of assessment. And that will have, it will be referred to as an original assessment, it will have a date of the assessment. SARS may then select this uh, person or this return principally for an audit, and after the audit, you will get a document containing the outcome of the audit. And it will say that we're going to now make an amended assessment. And we find that whatever you actually answer to this source will just go ahead and issue the additional assessment. So this is the scenario we're in. When we deal with the verification of the return and then an assessment issued under Section 95, no objection is possible. And I'm not talking to that now. We will deal with that in a later session if that's required. Right, so you will then get an SMS alerting you to that there is a notice of assessment. And of course, when you open up that notice of assessment, you find out that you've never earned that much money, that you now owe SARS, and you're aggrieved with the assessment. If you're happy with the assessment, if you finally sleep over it, then you do nothing further. But typically, you will disagree with that assessment and you want to object that. The process allows for you to ask reasons, and the, the SARS system, the e-filing system was changed, and it's a little bit more automated, and you will get an automated response as well, saying that we've received your uh, request for reasons, but I don't want to talk about that. So the little call-outs are the reference to the rules, that 6.1 is rule 6.1, and I'm dealing with the new rules that took effect on the 10th of March this year. SARS will give a response. I'll tell you what the reasons are. If you now understand what they've done, of course, then the end of the story. But typically, you will not understand and you want to object. And that is what we are dealing with now. So the taxpayer wants to object to the assessment. So the Tax Administration Act um, provides this legislative framework in which one can object. It says the taxpayer is aggrieved by an assessment made in respect of that taxpayer may object to the assessment. So it's not compulsory, but of course you want to object to that. Now then section 104, which deals with this um, in the Tax Administration Act then says that a taxpayer must lodge an objection within the period prescribed in the rules. And if we look at the rules, it's rule seven of the rules that says the taxpayer may, who may object to an assessment. So that follows from section 104 under Section 104 of the Tax Act, must deliver a notice of, a of objection. And that is the, the aim of my talk today, talking about the delivery of the notice of objection. Right. So, and this is where the 80 days come in. When must the notice of objection be delivered? So if we look at Rule 7.1, then just to repeat what we've said, a taxpayer who may object to an assessment must deliver a notice of objection within 80 days. And that 80 days, Previously, it was 30 days. So up until the end of, or 10th of March or 9th of March, uh, if an assessment was issued then, then you had to react within 80 day, within 30 days. From that day onward, we have the 80-day period. Right. Now, the 80-day is where it starts. And I'm going to do an example to sort of just bring this point home. It's either if you've requested reasons, then when you get the reasons, then your 80 days starts. But we're just dealing with the standard case 
We absolutely care what you what SARS has done. You object, you know, you don't need any further information. The grounds provided on the IT34 is sufficient. Then that 30, that 80 day period starts the date um, of assessment. So that's where the taxpayer has not requested reasons. Your period starts the date of the assessment. Now, let's have a look at that and I'm going to just define the terms and then I'm going to do an example to, to bring this all home. So date of assessment is defined in the Tax Administration Act as the date of issue of the notice of assessment, right? In the case of an assessment made by SAR. So that would be your VAT 217, your ITA 34, et cetera. Those are your, your VAT, VAT assessment, additional assessment, and your income tax assessment there, right? If it's not... Um, uh, an assessment made by SAR, so the self-assessment, in, in, in case of a self-assessment, the date of payment of the tax or the date that the return was actually submitted by the, the taxpayer. So we're just dealing with income tax. I'm not going to deal with that, the date that the return was submitted. We are dealing with the date of issue of the notice of assessment by SAR. So you will see on the assessment, and this is, as you can see, one, one recent one after, after the new rules took effect, You'll have a date of the assessment, 20, 28 March. You'll have the year of assessment. It will identify that this is not an original, but an additional assessment. And then they've got that period due date. For the, those of you that have been in tax a little bit longer than most other, you'll remember that it has a first date and a second date on. Now, those dates are, there's a payment date. In this case, it was the same as the date of assessment because it was a return submitted after the, the due date in, uh, well, it was after January this year. And then there's a period that you can not pay SARS and have an interest-free period. So those are all the dates on that. What is the important one is the date of assessment. That is the date of issue of the notice of assessment by SARS. So that's the 28th March one there. So we start counting on the 29th when we count the days. Why do we do that? We look at... Um, the day, the definition of days, I quickly want to run through that, and I've covered this in quite detail in the tax in, in practice session. A day means a business day. It's defined in Section 1 of the Tax Administration Act, and that act says it's a day which is not a Saturday, Sunday, or public holiday. And then it says, for purposes of determining the days of or a period allowed for complying with the provisions of Chapter 9, now, Chapter 9 is the Tax Administration Act part that deals with dispute resolution. It excludes the days between 16 December of each year and 15 January of the following year, both days inclusive, so you don't count them, right? If we look at the Tax Administration, now we we'll look at the Interpretation Act. So we've looked at the Tax Administration Act and it defines a business day, Not, and we'll do an example to exp explain what that is. It says where any particular number of days is prescribed for doing of any act, and this is now delivering that notice of objection, you reckon that exclusively of the first and inclusively of the last day, and unless it falls on the same day or any public holiday, in which case that shall be reckoned exclusively of the first day and exclusively also of the Sunday or public holiday. So if we look at that, we exclude the first day, which would be the date of assessment. So we don't count the 28th in our example. That's why we start on the 29th. We exclude all the Saturdays, Sundays, and public holidays in between. And then the last day is inclusive of the last day. That is what, what, what you count. That is the day that it must be in. So if we look at this is a scenario that I've had, I just took it. This is how I do it. <laughs> got little calendars where I tick it off and I count my, on my fingers. So we've got the date of assessment um, is the 28th of uh, March. So the counting starts and the 80 day counting starts on the 29th of March in of this year. So that's where I've got that. Then I exclude all the Sundays and Saturdays. And then of course we run through and we exclude all the public holidays because they don't count. And then we get down if I count it right was at the 26th of July. So any assessment that was issued on the 28th of March, that person is still within the 80 days and does not have to submit that um, assessment. Of course, you do not want to wait until the very last day to do that, but it often happens that, it ha that, that you get to that last day and that is why you want to count that. 
This, I must say, and uh, this process started of changing the 30 days to something longer when I was previously at Saika about 10 years ago, 10 uh, years ago. We made submissions and we said that SARS were issuing these assessments and they didn't alert taxpayers to the additional assessment. And then you, the first notice you got that you owe SARS money was when they started throwing you up and say, when are you going to pay that tax? And then you were out of time to make that objection. So this 80-day period certainly addressed that problem, but the other problems with that, and you know, if you want more detail on that, um, re listen to the uh, April session that we did in the tax in practice session. Okay, if you wanted to go the delivery of uh, requests for reasons, you would have done that on the what's at the 15th of May, so that's the 30-day period. So that and the reason I, I put that up is that didn't change. The only period that changed is 80 days to submit the objection. So what was also very important, and and you'll understand why I say that now, is that the note that the addresses for delivery, so delivery and visages that you actually in the old days took that notice of objection in, went to source and got an acknowledgement of receipt. Now the delivery and visages that it must be delivered to a specific address. So if we look at that notice, and it's a different notice to the notice changing the rules, the government notice. Um, delivery includes a, an electronic address or the address that the commissioner specified by public notice. So if we go to the public notice, we see that delivery of any document with regards to requests or reasons, etc., objections must be made through the taxpayer's e-filing page. So if you have been assessed and you've got that IT34, natural person, all of us are submitting the returns through e-filing, then you will submit that through the e-filing system. If it relates to a trust or a state duty or donations tax, of course, you will then make use of the uh, ADR. You complete an ADR, which still is a manual form, and then you will email it to contact us at sars.gov.za. I would ask a, a read receipt on that when I submit that, but it works well, so I've tried that and it's not a problem. If that is not available, then you must actually make an appointment through a send an email to SARS, make an appointment with a SARS branch like that pavilion, one, the Pretoria one that we've got that question on, and deliver it there. It, they actually create a virtual appointment and it works really well that you can then upload that. But, but just look at if what happens if we get this address wrong. Let's say you send it to PCC at SARS.gov which some of us have done in the past. In this court case, which was earlier this year, the judge said the applicant, which is the taxpayer, did not deliver the notices as prescribed by the public notice. And we've got this public notice. That was a different one. Uh, it was found to be fairly defective. So effectively, your the objection that you've delivered to the wrong address is as if you have not delivered that address. So. Absolutely critical that one must use the ones that is published in that notice, e-filing, if you use it on your personal name. So just in conclusion, I just want to quickly tell you what SARS must do, just to emphasize that it didn't change. So just if we look on a time period, we've got the, the date of issue of the assessment or the date of delivery of the reasons. You've got 80 days to deliver that notice of objection. Right. If you are after that, then... You've got 30 days, so 110 days, if you can provide reasonable grounds. If you miss that, if it's more than that, then you need to prove exceptional circumstances. So, and it requires a specific request from SARS to condone that late submission. What must happen from SARS's side? Their period starts on the date that you've delivered that objection. Within 30 days, they can ask you to give additional supporting documents for them to consider the objection. But if they don't make that 30 days, they must ask for extension. Then they can also regard your objection as invalid and within 30 days then return to you and give you 20 days to fix that one up. In all other instances, they must notify the taxpayer of the allowance or disallowance of the objection within 60 days after that. So nothing changed there. Um, 
Aya, uh, before I go back, um, I think Mike asked a question on that section six. Uh, Mike, the answer is yes, but bounce me an email and I'll give you a little bit more detail. I'm actually interested to know who told you that you can't get that. Yeah, that's quite important to make sure that we sort of iron out those. Thank you very much, Pete. There are indeed a couple of questions that are in the okay. chat that Pete will be addressing uh, shortly, okay, just you. after he's done with his particular presentation. And I think also we still have some members who are experiencing some gremlins there with the buffering process. So we are getting the technical team to work behind the scenes in order to be able to address that. So please do update us when all of that has been sorted. Yeah, 80 days, there seem to be a lot of timelines that people have to remember. Compliance is no easy minefield. No, absolutely not, Kaya, and it's, it's, it's something. Yeah, and I hope that I just simply get the right <laughs> practitioner to help me through that. We're going to move on to more matters relating to compliance now. And of course, the CIPC has become a very important organization, particularly since the whole grade listing process, where they've undertaken processes of trying to sort of meet us halfway. And I think the beneficial ownership process is obviously one that has created a lot of anxieties. We've had members asking about, well, what exactly does it mean? How do we reconcile the conflicts with the Protection of Personal Information Act? And all of those things. Guning. Guning, <laughs> yeah. Yes, Kai, we're going to have Lucinda Stian come, coming to, to talk about uh, the beneficial ownership information with us, giving us some updates and some important information that members need to be, be aware of. Um, Lucinda, you can now kick us off. Lucinda, are you good online? I am here. Yeah. Good morning. Welcome and good morning. Good morning to all of you. Um, I hope I am audible with all Very the gremlins so. that we have. Okay, fantastic. Uh, without any further ado, as indicated um, by Kai and MCC, the CIPC has uh, taken on quite an important role with regards to the beneficial ownership transparency that hit the country uh, a few years back already. And um, I'm going to take you through high level requirements in terms of compliance, and um, then we'll do questions at the end. Too fast. There we go. Okay, so. The CIPC participated in the FATF assessments, the Financial Action Task Force assessments, and based on the country's mutual evaluation assessment findings that were contained in the October 2021 evaluation report, considered addressing those specific deficiencies relating to making bio information of companies, specifically corporate vehicles, available in a timely, accurate, adequate, and verified way to law enforcement agencies and other regulatory bodies and accredited authorities. Uh, part of the mutual evaluation report was that South Africa should revise and substantially improve its mechanisms for ensuring that accurate, up-to-date, and verified beneficial ownership information is timely available to competent authorities and specifically law enforcement agencies. South Africa should thoroughly assess the money laundering and terror financing vulnerabilities of all types of legal persons, including the vulnerabilities that facilitate corruption in government procurement. Law enforcement agencies should be granted better powers to gain direct and timely access to beneficial ownership or, and control information for legal persons, and the law enforcement officers who investigate financial crimes be further trained about company structures and how uh, to more quickly identify and obtain bio information. Also to empower the CIPC to oppose, uh, impose administrative penalties directly, then the CIPC should also apply sanctions for failure to comply with information requirements. I know that this is quite a contentious area with regards to administrative penalties imposed by the CIPC and the beneficial ownership register. But um, I will discuss this a bit further on in the presentation and just to, to put your members at ease with regards to the penalties. The role of the CIPC, as everybody knows, the regulator in terms of the company as the regulator in terms of the Companies Act, as amended and read with the applicable regulations. The CIPC, amongst others, has a responsibility to educate on and uh, on 
voluntary compliance, monitor compliance, investigate non-compliance or contravention of the Act and other legislative legislations, as well as enforce compliance. The General Laws Amendment Act 22 of 2022 was written into law in, on the 29th of December of last year, which amended the Companies Act to mandate the CIPC to establish a beneficial ownership register. The Companies Act Regulations Amendment was promulgated on the 24th of May 2023. There's the Government Gazette notice if you need to look at it. It's also published on the CIPC website, and this provides legal backing to the CIPC requirements of the GLLA and, GLAA and the subsequent Companies Act Amendment. On the 24th of February, as everybody knows, South Africa is put on the FATF grey list, which means that, that, that South Africa is placed under increased monitoring while the country has committed to resolve the identified strategic deficiencies as indicated in the mutual evaluation report. The CIPC had to respond to the following after an action plan was devised. Uh, in particular, ensuring that competent authorities have timely, ac accurate and up-to-date beneficial ownership access on legal persons and arrangements, and also to apply sanctions for breaches or violations by legal persons to their BO obligations. This is legislative breaches on compliance obligations. The CIBC released its beneficial ownership register functionality on its e-services platform on the 1st of April 2023. This functionality provides for corporate vehicles, companies and closed corporations to submit with the CIBC details regarding its beneficial ownership status, which is 5% and above the agreed percentage in terms of the country, in terms of mentioned corporate vehicles. Failure to submit the required informa information is tantamount to non-compliance of the Companies Act, which could result in court-ordered administrative fines. Beneficial ownership information is required to be filed by the General Laws Amendment Act. This Act amended the Companies Act in relation to beneficial ownership and gave the Commission a mandate to request companies to file and update beneficial ownership information as and when applicable. The big question, what is beneficial ownership? A beneficial owner is defined in respect of a company is an individual, a warm body, who directly or indirectly ultimately owns that company or exercises effective control over the company. This ownership or control could be through the holding of beneficial interests in securities, the exercise of or control of the exercise of voting rights, the right or control of the right to appoint and remove directors. Uh, as many of you would know, there is a requirement, for example, in the Companies Act that a person can be mentioned in a company, MOI, that has the right to appoint and remove directors. That is effective control and um, that is a beneficial owner that needs to be declared. The ability to exercise control through a chain of ownership of a heuristic person other than a holding company of that company. A body of persons, corporate or unincorporate, this includes your body corporates registered as NPCs. A person acting on behalf of a partnership, a person acting in pursuance of a trust or agreement, your trustees, beneficiaries of trusts, beneficiaries of an agreement, etc. And then very widely, the ability to otherwise materially influence the management of companies. This last one um, is causing quite a problem um, out there in terms of what is material influence. And it's a responsibility of each company to have a look at uh, what constitutes material influence in terms of the management of a company, which translates to control and in effect of beneficial ownership. State-owned companies will also be required to file beneficial ownership information unless they're exempted by the Minister in terms of Section 9.2 of the Companies Act. CIPC is committed to the establishment and maintenance of the Beneficial Ownership Register. We have been contributing as a member of the... Um, excuse me, as a member since 2015, though some years the committee was not active. 
the CIPC Beneficial Ownership Register was rolled out, as mentioned, on the 1st of April 2023. And to date, we have received 617 successful filings of BO information. Data recorded on this register will also be analyzed on a risk-based approach to ascertain trends around the world with regards to ultimate ownership transparency in corporate vehicles. The main purpose of beneficial ownership transparency is to assist law enforcement in the fight against money laundering and financing of terror activities. CIPC continues to support and form part of engagements like this one with the private sector or civil society to provide clarity and certainty in terms of beneficial ownership. The attached slide is just a bit of an example that uh, explains what a complex, it's not even this isn't a complex structure of beneficial ownership. In this example, you have Sipu who owns 60% of company A, uh, ABC Trust owns 5% of company A, and Lucia Smith owns 4%. Company A owns 100% of the declaring company. However, Lucia Smith owns 34% indirectly of the declaring company through a separate agreement. So it's examples like these that you, uh, each company needs to look at and drill down to the ultimate beneficial owner at the end of the line. Another example for you, just to explain, uh, Lucia Stain, for example, is an 80% shareholder in ABC Marketing. This company would not be required to file beneficial ownership information in terms of Lucia Stain because the 80% shareholding refers to known information. She's a shareholder and legal owner. This is known information. The information in terms of the above would, however, still be provided to the CIPC in the form of the filed securities register, as explained in Section 33.1, capital A, small a of the Companies Act. Within each company's securities register, the prescribed BO information must be recorded as well. Section 50 of the Act refers to this. In other words, no separate recording or filing of a beneficial ownership is required. If there are any, if there isn't any with this 80% shareholding, uh, it will be contained in the securities register already filed with the CIPC. If, for example, we continue, Lucia Stain held 25% of her existing 80% shareholding in ABC Marketing on behalf of another person, Luan Smith, the 25% effectively being to the benefit of Luan Smith, it makes him a beneficial owner of ABC Marketing and this information must be declared. The beneficial ownership information of Luan Smith would also be indicated in the securities register of ABC Marketing as per the Companies Act requirements. The reason why the securities register will be filed in both these instances, the one with and but in the second one, uh, beneficial ownership information of the specific person needs to be declared and the documentation uploaded is to ensure triangulation and validation of the information submitted and uh, shared with competent authorities. Beneficial ownership, uh, the submission of beneficial ownership information is done through a fully automated functionality to be updated as and when the information changes but not less than once annually. The registered functionality can be found on the e-services platform and any person can file the beneficial ownership information on behalf of a legal person, provided that the written mandate is in place for such filing. The mandate form part of the compulsory supporting documents that must be filed. The disclosure of this register is anticipated to be an online automated process in line with the existing disclosure process with the caveat that the requesters of this information will be vetted and verified as law enforcement agencies, regulatory bodies, accredited authorities, etc. So the, the data on beneficial ownership register will not be available to the public. The aim of the BO register is to have a repository or a register of persons who owns or exercise control over legal entities and to insist law enforcement both nationally and internationally with relevant information when it comes to the investigation of ultimate owners of entities with specific reference to money laundering and terror financing activities. Uh, the attached slide is just an indication of where you can find the beneficial 
ownership register and filing capability on the CIPC website, e-services, beneficial ownership is right there at the bottom and you can start the process. Compliance and enforcement, non-compliant BO filings is to trigger a possible investigation and a compliance notice to make it very clear Non-compliance with BO filings means legislative requirements. There wasn't a filing of BO or the security register or beneficial interest register that was required. And this may trigger a possible investigation from the CIPC side and the issue of a compliance notice for companies to comply. Also, a risk-based approach to be followed in the monitoring of the register filings and certain sampling thereof. With the risk-based approach, we are looking at uh, sampling specific filings, looking at NPCs specifically, looking at state-owned entities specifically, and the type of uh, beneficial ownership filings that we are receiving. Compliance notices, administrative fines, disqualification of directors are some of the sanctions that may be imposed for non-compliance. If there is uh, perceived non-compliance in terms of beneficial ownership, the normal filing of a complaint through the COR 135.1 complaints um, at CIPC is required. Next steps for the CIPC, um, MOUs with registers, registries. The commission has conducted an analysis with regards to external companies registered and identified key jurisdictions. Um, we are engaging to, with these jurisdictions to conclude memorandums of understanding while others are already in place for information sharing and triangulation of the information that we offer on our records and that these foreign jurisdictions hold in theirs. Information sharing with other regulators and law enforcement. The Commission has been working with other agencies in developing the system to collect the beneficial ownership information. And this information will also be triangulated with these different entities, SARS, FAC, FSCA, et cetera, to, share the, to ensure that the information submitted on the beneficial ownership register correspond with what is held by all these other entities. Plans for listed companies, affected companies. The commission provides a separate dispensation in relation to affected companies, which are listed on a recognized exchange. The purpose is mainly to avoid the duplication of records that such info is collected and kept in the records on other competent authorities like straight Jay-Z computer share. The sharing of this information will be periodically uh, available on an interagency basis. This will, however, not include affected companies which are not listed on an exchange. In terms of the beneficial ownership register, um, once you uh, start with the filing of the BO, there is a, a requirement to indicate whether you are uh, an affected company or not. Once that box is ticked of an affected company, you are only required to uh, do not provide beneficial ownership information, even if there is any beneficial owners. We understand that this could be quite a, a voluminous amount of information and only the upload of the securities register or beneficial interest register is required in that regard. I also shared some links with you from the CIPC website on guidelines in terms of uh, beneficial ownership legislative requirements, filing requirements, guidance note, notice the 25th of May, which provides uh, guidance on the dates when beneficial ownership needs to be filed. Also, the regulations, as mentioned in the Government Gazette, can also be found on the CIPC website and a, an extensive list of uh, frequently asked questions on beneficial ownership is also available for your viewing later on. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That is it for me. 
Uh, thank you very much, Lucinda. So we've, we do have some questions, and there's a particular one that is of interest that I think came up twice, at least, uh, regarding connection to the CIPC, I'm sorry, the Department of uh, Home Affairs. So it seems like members are, are having a challenge with regards to that connection. That doesn't always work. So there's, I think there's an, even a question from Gerard regarding whether, um, given the practical challenges that members face, uh, if there's a possibility for an extension. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we are experiencing the same problem with Department of Home Affairs with all our services filings. Um, this is an ongoing issue. What uh, Department of Home Affairs have indicated to us is that uh, this is particularly a problem during the high volume filing process which is usually between 10 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the afternoon is where the, the traffic is highest, which causes the, the Department of Home Affairs issues. Um, I can just put all your members at ease that the CIPC will not impose any sanctions uh, in terms of something that is beyond our control and any of our finance control. And uh, if the need be, extension will definitely be proposed be provided to comply with the beneficial ownership requirements. All right. Um, there's a couple of other follow-up questions, and I think probably questions relating to trust and NPCs are the ones that cause a greater sense of anxiety, because obviously some trusts are discretionary and some NPCs do not have a sense of defined sense of ownership, you may call it that. So Astrid is asking, the beneficial ownership for trusts, how far back should info in the information be captured, or do you simply submit what amounts to the current information that is currently held with the master's office? That's the first question. The second one from Fiona says the a, a beneficial ownership button insists that you must choose a percentage ownership. How do you then split the percentage ownership amongst directors when it is an NPC with directors but no members, which is obviously quite a common feature of how we put our juristic juristic structures in the past? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Okay, uh, let me just tend to uh, Fiona's question specifically. For with regards to uh, the beneficial ownership information, we are trying to indicate that uh, this is our first phase development in terms of beneficial ownership. We are at a later stage going to be providing for, uh, as indicated, voting interest, uh, the control or the uh, uh, power to appoint and remove directors, which is difficult to uh, attach a percentage to that. And that requirement will be built into the system at a later stage where directors for of NPCs without members, for example, will be able to uh, select that specific uh, button on the drop down list and then input their information in that regard. Um, as to this question with regards to trust, the only trust information that this is filed with the CIPC is where trusts or uh, owners or beneficial owners of corporate entities. The trust specific information as in the trustees, the beneficiaries, uh, etc., is to be filed with the master's office. Also at a later stage, part of our uh, phase two development is to triangulate and consolidate all this data with the master's office, um, with SASH, with FIC, and then um, to disclose that information to law enforcement agencies as a platform for traveling to the warm body at the end of the line that, that holds beneficial ownership. So for now, on the beneficial ownership register, you will be able to indicate that there is a trust that is a beneficial owner, but not provide the trust information or the warm bodies information uh, beyond that line. There is a disclosure form also available um, that uh, is not a standard template. All that we require as an uploaded document is to give a short breakdown of uh, there are two trusts that are beneficial owners of this uh, ABC marketing company, for example. 
and uh, sub upload that document without providing full details on the warm bodies related to those trusts. That information will be submitted to the master of the high court, specifically on the trust beneficiaries, the trustees, etc. And later on, that information will be triangulated between the different um, regulators. Thank you. Um, another follow up question, Lucinda, and it's probably one of those where members are curious about the uh, linearity between a company that has a single director and a shareholder on whether one even needs to bother to file anything. So the question from Katrina says, do we still file BO register information for privately owned companies with only one or two directors or members? And I suspect the question is, does the system in instinctively assume that, well, sole ownership must translate to sole beneficial ownership? How are you guys dealing with that? I'm I'm sorry, I have no sound on my side, so I missed that complete question. <laughs> can you hear me now, Lucinda? I can hear you now, yes, thank yes. you. So the question from Katrina was, do we still file beneficial ownership information for privately owned companies with only one or two directors or members? Uh, remember, there is a difference between a known legal owner and a beneficial owner, as per my example. Mm -hmm. In the instances where there is no beneficial ownership, uh, you have a 100% shareholder and it's also the sole director of a privately owned company. The legislative requirements kick in for a securities register to be uploaded with the CIPC. If there's no beneficial ownership to declare, then that information isn't um, indicated at all. Only the securities register is then uploaded in terms of the legislative requirements. Okay. A follow-up question from my side. You mentioned that you've had over 600 successful filings. Has the CIPC already picked up some insights on what seem to be the common challenges that those that are trying to file have encountered? And are you looking at perhaps refining the processes or is this the sample size still too small for us to sort of know how well the system is functioning? Uh, absolutely. The issue that we have picked up and we are building the announcements as we speak, um, hopefully they will be released by the end of the month. Um, or in the first week of, of July of the new enhancements. And please keep um, the CIPC website, just uh, have a look there. All announcements or enhancements on the BO system will be widely communicated. Is that uh, currently the system um, requires you to indicate beneficial ownership information. Uh, in the example uh, by Katrina earlier that uh, one where there is just 100% shareholder or one or two, and there's no beneficial ownership to declare the system doesn't allow you to proceed without submitting beneficial ownership information. And this is to be corrected immediately because these types of companies should be able to only upload their um, securities register without completing any beneficial ownership information. In terms of system, in all, we haven't, uh, started looking at the actual data being submitted. What we are going to start with is to look at uh, baseline verification of information. For example, does the certified ID copy that was uploaded comply with requirements? Not older than three months, uh, does the ID correspond with the information that was submitted? Uh, looking at the securities register, is the required information indicated in there? The mandate that must be submitted in, and is mandatory, was it um, signed, dated? All of those baseline requirements that we're going to verify first. And then later on, once the system has been developed fully, we can start looking at our risk-based approach and analysis of the individual filings more fully. All right, Lucinda, just one, two last uh, small Anyana questions. The first one, I think, is the one of clarity from Jonathan. Am I correct that every company and CC has to submit this? And then I think you may have covered Sue's question in a bit, but her question is, if a company owns the shares of another company, must the beneficial ownership information be filed? Okay, so again, it is the responsibility each company to ascertain if there is an actual beneficial owner attached. 
um, to this company. If not, shareholding is not necessarily a beneficial ownership, as per my example as well. Uh, but all companies and CCs need to comply with the filing of the securities register or members register as uh, to get all that information up to date and then um, annually with the annual returns that information will be updated uh, will be updated as well so uh, it's difficult to indicate uh, specific scenarios if you have this uh, a heuristic company holding shares in another company is that uh, beneficial ownership that needs to be filed my opinion on that is not beneficial ownership because it's known ownership it's legal ownership uh, but it needs to be contained in the securities register which is filed with the cipc in any event all right lucinda thank you very much for that and i can say we are temporarily releasing you because clearly there's going to be many more conversations to be had as the system gets refined, as members learn how to file and they perhaps discover new interesting pitfalls and challenges that would like the CIPC to help us with. Sizi, I think for me, obviously, the, the interesting curiosity is that every single touristic entity must ultimately explain where the money goes. So there must always be a beneficial owner and it's simply a matter of how do we actually dig through that information and finally find out who all those people are. Yes. I think that's quite the objective of this is we need to know ultimately who is benefiting from these corporations. Yeah, so definitely the CIPC will be a more common feature of these particular tech talks given how topical this issue is. And thank you very much to the members that post questions. One of the most interesting, I suppose, developments over the past couple of years has been the fact that as economies tanked and pandemics hit us, companies had to really apply their minds on assessing their future viability. And I think the concept of going concern has never been as topical as it is now. Yes, certainly, Kaya. We have seen a lot of uh, difficulties being faced by, by companies over the past couple of years and, and many leading to closures. And, and now is the time to really look at the going concern standard and see if it's still applicable and relevant. And I think we're going to have Coin Stokes, who's a member of SICA, to come and, and talk to us about some of the changes that are being proposed for, for, for ISA 570. And uh, Cohen is an active member of SICA. He is the chair of the National uh, Small and Medium Practices uh, Interest Group. He's also a member of the Assurance Guidance Committee. And he's also a participant in the CEDIA Partners Forum. So uh, Cohen is the chair of the, or is the lead, rather is the chair of the task group that is going to be making submissions on the exposure draft relating to the standard and has come to us to talk about some of these changes. Uh, Cohen, you can go ahead with, the, with your presentation. Thank you very much. All of those repayments. Oh, it's so interesting, Pete spoke about 80 days, that's been a, quite a long time. But if we look at it, just uh, a bit of guidance of the issue where it started off, during September 2020, the International Audit and Assurance Standards Board has published a discussion paper. They tried to link forward and also going on stand in order to manage statements. They tried to understand what was the difficulties that the auditors experienced. During this year, April, they've then released an exposure draft only on the going concern standard, where they've asked for some input. Uh, Charlie, Charlie. applications 18 months after that it only becomes effective so that's quite far down the line but it's in like you've correctly stated very relevant in the current economic environment as well as also forward looking towards what is around the corner so the objective that this standard is all set down from the standards board is that to support the public interest and more specifically to protect it so it promotes some practices consistent practice and behavior it also supports the auditors position to evaluate management assessment. As most probably you should know, the auditor relies on management to present certain matters during the audit. And one of the biggest unknowns for all auditors to consider is that of going concern or what the management have prepared and the facts that is known to them. And this actually strengthens the auditor's position to ask more questions, be more diligent on this, and also to get to a conclusion if the entity will then be indeed a going concern for the foreseeable future. And in last, it also enhances the transparency that the, the auditor 
put in an audit report for the user of the financial. So that's some of the main objectives. Some of the changes that in the standard is, first of all, it clearly defines the term material uncertainty. So what does us as auditors need to look at? What do management need to present to us? It provides some clarity in certain ambiguous terms like may cause significant doubt. There are some changes in terms of, and I think this is one of the biggest change, is when do we actually start to consider? From what time do we look forward for going consent? In the past, it was from the reporting date, and now going forward, it will be from the date of the approval of the financial statements. So that is quite a significant change. If I may use an example, let's say for a hypothetical entity, I have a few challenges to present information to the auditor. The auditor only signed up the financial statements 10 months after hearing. In the past, you would consider the going concern from hearing, so take the example, from the end of February 2023, and by October 2020, apologies, December 2023, 10 months later, you will sign up the financial statements, and your assessment of going concern will only be then considered the next two months, being the period till the next financial year. In the new standard, your assessment of going concern will only start in December 2023, and that's a much longer timeline in terms of the considerations for both management as well as the auditors on representation for management. The concern that was raised in some other comments also, specifically in terms of the risk assessment standard, more familiar known as ISA 315 revised, is about the identification of any event condition, even through your planning stage, that may have an impact on the ability to continue as a going concern and what would then be management responses in either the presentation of certain amounts and or disclosures on the financial statements. So this forces the auditor to have a much more stronger view, a robust evaluation, and engage then with management on this. Also to add to that, it's about the intent and ability. So in the past, if you have a group structure, some of the entities will present a letter from the holdings company to confirm that they will support the entity in the foreseeable future. Now the question is also for auditor, do we evaluate the intent and ability of that party to actually support? Again, more requirements by the auditor, but also the evaluation from management to present to the auditor what is actually deemed to be the underlying support of the current consent principle. With that also, professional skepticism. Us as auditors need to discharge our duty and therefore there's some enhanced application material that is quite detailed in this exposure draft to consider. And then also to add to that is the material uncertainty is also the scalability that we need to consider during our procedures. If we look at the entity that's only got hypothetical investment property, you will look at the terms of the contract. But if you have an entity with multiple regions that they trade in or demographic countries, there will definitely be much more consideration but the standard as well as application material speaks to that. So from that, the biggest single change that we see in the standard is now you need to have a, a paragraph or a section in your audit report to actually address the going concern. So there must be a positive statement on going concern on all financial statements. So in the past, those of you that are either auditors or, or using financial statements, well, remember that we only address it if there's a material uncertainty or it have an impact on our audit opinion. Now there must be a positive statement. So there's quite a few different scenarios. So during some of the previous discussions, this was almost said that the auditor must approach this like a, a little robot, a red, amber, and a green status. So if there's no concerns, the new standard will require you to then have a paragraph to indicate that you've concluded on the management views and that in evidence have not identified any material uncertainty. If there's some challenges, you will need to highlight it. And that in its own possesses quite a few challenges, what is already discussed in the financials and what management allows us to address in the audit report. In the event where there's a listed entity that you audit, there will be much more requirements in terms of your reporting. So you would need to report then that you had, first of all, if there's no issue, or no, no concern about it, you would then conclude there's no material uncertainty, and you will also need to describe how you have evaluated this. 
if there's then a concern about the going concern, no pun intended, you will need to also address the description of how you've done the work and what was your actual findings during the audit. And I think specifically on our listed entities, that's the biggest challenge. What can the auditor disclose or not in terms of the audit report? And what is the engagement of your client? And again, speaking back to the timelines, in the past, it was as of year end, and now you would need to look from the date of approval 12 months into the future. So like I said, much more requirements from auditor to evaluate what is management's assessment and what management present them to the auditors. So to the, the current timeline, we need to submit the, apologies, comments to the IWSB on 24 August. Both Erba and Saika intend to submit some comments. I would request all of the members in attendance that if you have any submissions to make, please do it earlier rather than later. To, to summary, that is part of the Saika standards team. If you would like to address it directly to Erba, there's also in the slides, you will have a link to address it directly to Erba by 28 July. And then lastly, if you'd like to submit it directly to the standards board, you can do so by 24 August. The intention from Saika's side is to address this in a comment letter, most probably submitted late, oh, apologies, finalized late July, early August for then submission before the deadline. So, Mrs. Ikaya, back to you. I'm not sure if there's any questions or any comments from the audience. Yes, Quinn, there are a couple of questions. The one that I'd like to pose to you is, you know, this idea that you have to change the commencement date of the assessment from the date of, you know, year end up until the date of approval. I foresee some practical limitations there because you can imagine for some entities, by the time we get to approving financial statements, the substantive work that was undertaken related to information that existed at year end. So does this now translate to auditors having to do much more work on a developments in the interim? How do we reconcile that? So I think there's two, two pillars on that to start. First of all, it would be management's assessment. Mm. Management must first of all assess the going concern. So management must actually do some more work to present to the auditors. And then the auditors will also, like we also understand in the standards known subsequent events, will consider items up to the date of approval in terms of the going concern assessment. So as an example, if there's a fund that funding from a bank that needs to be re reapproved you would need to consider was that approval actually obtained. Now, the practical to your point, I think that the conundrum that we must possibly face is that in some instances, the auditors' financials, audited financial statements will be utilized to approve funding for the next year. Now you can't finalize the financial statements because you are not known if the finance will be approved. So there's definitely a few practical concerns. And I think as the auditor, you will need to engage your clients right at the offset of the audit during the planning phase to address this, get their buy-in requirements or what you would expect and highlight that to the client and much quicker get their responses than actually waiting just to the date of signing. Yeah. Another one is I think during the pandemic, we probably were able to do the type of um, research insights that were not probably available before in the sense that everybody would have said, look, this is the basis of our gun concern assessments. And then you saw the developments relating to the pandemic that then made it very clear that perhaps the type of foresight that everyone had had was being undermined by other events. Have we now got some insights onto how relevant even the 12 month timeframes that we used to use are um, and how companies actually react to external events in order to refine or even revise that going concern assessment? Yeah, I think, uh, again, I would like to comment on two matters there. First of all, it's the start of this management and you as the auditor will need to engage with the client. But to your point, I think this is much more speaking to more sophisticated entities that will actually be able to respond to this rather than your, your privately held entities. So the concern for me in the standard as such is how do you address the, the events that you need to consider if management doesn't do the assessment? How do you engage with the client to get the right information before you actually have that positive statement in the financial statements? So I think the concern back to the, the old standard is that timeline, what would actually be considered and have effect on the financial statements 10, 11, 12 months after year end 
that maybe wasn't known on the reporting day. And that is the conundrum that we need to address, most probably in our submission in terms of the, the, the standards board, and hopefully they will then address it in the final standard to give us either some gray area to, to consider, or, or questions or application material order to consider rather than having this explicit statement that you will need to make a decision and then most probably modify your audit report also. Hmm. Could also, I suppose there's going to be a, a difference between uh, a, a, a particular entity. So if you think, for example, public entities probably have a six-month reporting window period. Listed entities have a much shorter reporting window period to the GS. In, so that now suddenly says that companies that probably have the same year end may actually end up with rather different outcomes based on when the approval of financial statements materializes. Does that create particular concerns around comparability of reports and financial statements? A very good question. One, first of all, I agree with you. It will definitely uh, pose a challenge to the user of the financial statements in terms of what is actually relevant to the user. But the second concern that we've raised also in our task group discussions is in the event that you have used in terms of compatibility, my question is rather if you, of all audit reports will have a paragraph that refers to the great concern statement, what will be the impact? Will we actually have a user that will understand if there is a material uncertainty, how the paragraph was modified, or will we get to the point where you actually just consider it's an unmodified audit opinion with no modifications going concern, and we check it and we go on, or would that audit report actually still have the value that we try to address the concern about the protection of public interest? Definitely a lot of de interesting developments that are looming, and I suspect that in the comments that we will be submitting and that members will be submitting, many more issues are obviously going to emerge from this. I don't think we've covered the entire spectrum of what might or might not happen, Sisi. No, certainly. I think there's a lot uh, to, to this going concern matter. Yeah. And members, please do remember, you're exactly one month away from the deadline for your submissions to URBA, which is the 28th of July, and then you have about four more weeks for the submissions to the International Assurance and, Account and Auditing Standards Board. So please make sure that you do put forward your comments because the, the process needs to be informed by the lived experiences of the people that will actually have to do the work. Otherwise, we're going to have serious problems when it comes to implementation. Absolutely, and I think it is important that members do make those submissions because ultimately this comes back to affect them uh, in the work that they do on a daily. Kun, I think you're going to have a lot of uh, information coming your way as the one responsible for crafting Saika's official submissions. So good luck to you and thank you very much for joining us. Since you, we're moving full steam ahead. Moving on to ethics now, aren't we? Absolutely, an important topic and it has been for a while and in it, for the profession it always has been. Uh, but I think we've seen a lot of activity in the, on the ethics front as a profession uh, with a lot of questions and concerns. So next up we're going to have Viola who's going to present to us ISBA's uh, proposed strategy and work plan for 2024 to 2027. And Viola has been with the Institute, uh, that is SICA, for the past seven years, I believe, um, before working with Ioannita uh, as project manager for reporting in the assurance and practice. Viola, do you want to talk to us about that proposed strategy of the ISBA? Uh, thank you, Mrs. Morning to all our viewers. Uh, I'm going to take you through the strategy and uh, work plan for eyes uh, for 2024 to 2027. So ISBA has released the strategy and uh, the comments are due by the 7th of July, 2023. I have included the link uh, for ease access uh, to those who want to go through the, uh, the proposed strategy. So in, in coming up with this strategy, uh, the ISBA has uh, also had some consultation uh, from different stakeholders. Uh, then they came up with the consultation paper uh, after also taking into account the uh, survey, that a strategy survey that they had in April 2022. So it was released for comments, then like we submitted our comments. So in coming up with this strategy, they took also those comments. Uh, into account. They also consulted uh, with the ISPA Consultative Advisor Group and other stakeholders. 
They also engaged with the uh, International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, which is the RAASB. So this consultation paper uh, text uh, for this structure, it has got the request for comments in section one and proposed strategy uh, in section two, and the section three is the proposed work plan. Uh, so uh, ISPA is like uh, proposing to say maybe by qu quarter three of 2023, uh, they will approve the final strategy work plan, which is like in December 2023. So you need to keep looking out to like when it's released the final uh, strategy work plan. So in the strategy work plan, uh, uh, it covers the following. Uh, they have the proposed strategy drivers. Under the proposed strategy drivers, they have the environmental drivers and operational drivers. Just to mention a few, under the environmental uh, drivers, uh, they're looking at ongoing impact of technological transformation. As you know, like uh, there is a lot of changes when it comes to, to, uh, to technology. Then also the rapid growing market and public demand for sustainability information. Then on the operational drivers, uh, they're looking at the global operability of the ISPA standards and the further increasing of global adoption of the code and supporting its effective implementation. As you know, like there's a lot of people who are also like adopting uh, the code. Then uh, the proposed strategic, uh, strategic themes, so like this is the things that are included in the strategy work plan. Uh, so on the strategic uh, themes, uh, they're trying to look at strengthening the court, uh, further enhancing the diversity of stakeholder perspective, and also widening the influence of the ISPA standards to say like it should like impact a number of uh, a, a number of areas. Uh, then the projects work streams that will commence uh, before 2024. So this is what they are planning to say, like before 2024, they like to do the sustainability. Uh, so it's going to come in two streams, which is the, the first stream is independence, then the second one is, is, is the second one is ethics. And they like going to release the exposure draft uh, by quarter four of 2023. The other work that they are also going to look at is the use of experts. As you know, like that in the in, in the area of ethics, there is like there's a number of use of ethics that is taking place uh, in the auditing space. So they are trying to also like do some work on the use of experts. They are looking forward to approve uh, the exposure draft by quarter four of 2023 or so. So the other uh, projects include the collective investment vehicles and the post-implementation review of non-compliance to laws and regulations. We are all aware that NOCLA came into effect in 2017. And after that, uh, there was no post-implementation that was done. And the people, we have lots of questions uh, and people who are not understanding uh, no class. So they are planning to say they will do the groundwork in quarter four of 2023. So we'll be looking forward to say, like, what are they going to include in the post implementation? The other potential new topics that they have identified. Uh, so they have identified to say they need to work on the role of CFOs and other senior. Uh, public accountants and business, the business relationships, the definition and description of terms. So also they are going to cover the custody of uh, data. As you know, to say like data is uh, is become so uh, crucial and the communication with those charged with governance. So this, these are the topics that they have identified, but as you know, to say this is just like a proposal, you are welcome also to like maybe to, to say, are you agreeing with these topics? Uh, is there any other topics that you think should be included or should not be covered? Then on the pre-committed uh, work streams to commence during or after quarter one of 2024, uh, so like these ones are the post-implementation. 
uh, of the different uh, uh, other exposure trusts we had before. We had the long association phase two, the restructured court, the non-assurance service and fees, and the definition of public interest ended. So like these ones now, they want to come back and do the post-implementation review uh, to check to say like since the time that they implemented, how is it going? And they've also put their possible timelines that they think they will be able to cover this uh, post-implementation reviews. Uh, so the next uh, page just shows the summary of the, 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 the work stream that we were discussing to say like which ones are fall, going to fall in 2024, in 2025, 2026, and 2027 as we are, as you know, to say like this is covering uh, the, the, the strategy work plan for 2024 to 2027. So like these are the uh, the projects that I have gone through already, but in this uh, summary page, I've just liked if I put it so that it's easier to, for you to check to say which ones are coming in 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 which year. So as, as SICA, we are going to be submitting the comments uh, on behalf of members and associates. Therefore, if you have any comments that you would like to send through SICA, you are welcome to send to the email provided. Uh, if you can send us by the 3rd of July so that we'll get time to consolidate and send to AESPA. However, you're also welcome to send your comments directly to AESPA. Uh, then on the upcoming sessions for ethics, as you know that like there is a requirement to reflect on ethics uh, for all the members. Uh, so we are having monthly ethics and practice sessions. I have included the link uh, for the booking. So in July, we have the ethics uh, and essential ingredient infective fraud. Uh, then in August, we have Before You Blow the Whistle, Ethics and Sustainability. So you're welcome to visit the events page uh, then so that you can book the session that you'd like to attend. So each session uh, counts for two hours CPD for the text practitioners like who still like have to, uh, to submit the, the, the number of hours uh, uh, for ethics reflection. Then uh, October is our ethics month. So we are trying to put together some events that uh, we are going to have in October uh, for ethics. So please keep checking our events calendar as it will be put through soon so that like you, you don't miss uh, the events that are coming. Then uh, the last page, I've also put uh, the useful online resources that I thought like they can be useful to all the members. Uh, maybe in case you are not sure where to get the Psycho Code of Professional Conduct, I've included the link. Uh, then the NOCLA response framework, we have the page that we have dedicated uh, for NOCLA and you've put some information relating to NOCLA. Then also, as you know, that uh, the events, uh, uh, we have a new link for the uh, Psyca events. I've also included it. Then I also lastly included uh, the link to the ethics in practice uh, uh, sessions that will be coming throughout the year. So thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Over to you. Is there anyone with a person? No, thank you very much, Viola. We do not see any questions there on the chat box, so I think you've bowled members over with this ethics update. And of course, I'll thank you very much for all those online resources that we can always just tap into in order to refresh our minds about important developments in the ethics space. So thank you very much, Viola. We'll definitely have you back again sometime soon. We're now moving full steam ahead towards matters of policy and regulation. And of course, the Reserve Bank. Most people, when they hear that the Reserve Bank is about to say something, they get scared because it's always 50 basis points, 100 basis points. It's Kaya, tough times, eh? Kaya, actually, I was wishing that that was the discussion in terms of the decrease that we could be expecting, but I've got a feeling that this is not what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not the bearer of good news. I'm not about to decrease interest rates, but we are joined by somebody who understands the Reserve Bank and its operations much better than you. 
you and I, and this is Pearl Malumani, who is a senior policy analyst uh, in the Policy and Regulation Division within the National Payment System of the South African Reserve Bank. She has been involved in strategic policy projects that enhance our safety and the integrity, of course, of the national payment system. Also worked extensively in supporting innovation, competition, and financial inclusion. And I think what we are trying to get from um, Pearl is essentially the developments that are happening in that particular regulatory space and also what it means for us as citizens and as members. Yes, absolutely. That's what she's going to be talking about uh, this morning. All right. Hopefully Pearl is ready to start. Pearl, are you there? Um, yes. Um, are you able to see the presentation we can hear you i haven't been able to see the presentation yet uh, i can see your face just working on okay, the technical let me try aspect to share again. yeah all right are you able to see the presentation and also are you able to see me uh, we can see you we can hear you can't see the presentation yet i'll let you know as soon okay. as it becomes visible and yeah you, you can proceed all right. Yeah, I think you can start with the introduction, Pearl, in the meantime, while we get the slides up. Oh, okay. All right. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Pearl Malumani. I'm from the Policy and Regulation Division in the um, National Payment System Department at the Reserve Bank. Uh, don't worry, I'm not a bearer of bad news. I'm just going to uh, present on the developments of the national payment system. So today we will address what is the national payment system, Vision 2025, and the review of the National Payment System Act and on the um, NPS developments. So the mandate of the Reserve Bank is to achieve and maintain price stability in the interest of a balanced and sustainable economic growth in South Africa. And also it's to promote financial stability. Um, this is in relation to the Financial Sector Regulation Act, where we are aware that it's that uh, Twin Peaks uh, regulation, where it focuses on prudential uh, and, um, and consumer protection, as well as focusing on financial stability and also to promote and maintain the effective functioning of the national payment uh, system. So uh, the objective of the national payment system is the uh, safety, efficiency, integrity, and stability of the payment system. And the national payment system is a key pillar to the smooth functioning of the financial system. So what is the national payment system? So the national payment system, it encompasses the entire payment process from payer to beneficiary, and it includes settlement between banks. The process includes all tools, systems, mechanisms, institutions, agreements, procedures, rules, or laws applied to utilize and to effect uh, payment. So essentially, the national payment system enables the circulation of money. And that is, it enables transacting uh, parties to exchange values. So if you're going to a store to uh, buy groceries, um, it's within the national payment system. Buying online, uh, salary payments, dividends payments, uh, debit orders, when you receive and send money, whether using a card or an EFT credit, um, real-time clearing, this is where a transaction uh, will be sent through in 60 seconds um, and also now we also have um, pay shop whether you're using an atm or your cell phone to make payments or the internet or you are swiping or taping your card this all goes through the national payment system so what is important within the national payment system is our vision so um, we have issued visions over the years. So the latest one is vision 2025. So it's a vision that was developed by the national payment system together with the um, other sub departments and uh, inputs from the sub executives as well as the um, inputs from the industry. So as you are, you, you may be aware 
um, as I had presented earlier, that the objective, the primary objective of the national payment system um, department is to promote and maintain the efficiency, stability, um, integrity, and safety of the national payment system. However, it also it is also important that um, other objectives are achieved through the national payment system. So um, these are the nine goals that the Reserve Bank, as well as the industry and other industry um, participants, strive to achieve by 2029. So the first one is promoting competition and um, innovation. Uh, financial inclusion, regional integration, interoperability, cost effectiveness, transparency and public accountability, a clear and transparent regulatory and governance framework, financial stability and security, flexibility and adaptability and um, cost effectiveness. So maybe let me just provide an, an example of the um, current um, initiative that are taking place uh, supporting um, financial inclusion, cost effectiveness, and a clear and transparent regulatory framework, as well as uh, promoting competition and innovation. So currently in the NPS, in relation to the provision of payment services, which involve pulling of funds. So if a non-bank wants to provide um, that e-money, -E um, uh, or a non-bank wants to provide a remittance service, so any payment service that involves a pulling of funds, it is regarded, it's currently regarded as deposit taking. So they would need to partner with a bank to provide um, that service. So um, you are aware that for example, uh, ShopRite has um, um, money remittance service. So for that to happen, it would need to uh, to partner with the bank. Uh, you are aware that um, MTN has Momo money. Uh, for them to provide that service, they would need to uh, partner with the bank. So um, the, uh, the Vision 2025 aims that they should be um, more competition in the payment space, that non-banks should be able to provide uh, payment services which involve pulling of funds um, without the need to partner with the bank. We believe that this will assist in relation to deepening uh, financial inclusion, cost effectiveness, the cost of providing payment services will be cheaper as there will be more uh, competition. And also the issue of um, interoperability is promoted um, because currently, for example, with the uh, banks, the banks have their different, um, in, in f &B, they have that e-wallet service where you're able to send money to a cell phone. But uh, currently, if, um, for example, I'm using uh, f &B, if I want to withdraw money from um, that e-wallet, I will only, I can only access in, a, an, an f &B ATM, so I can't go to an EPSA ATM or a Capitec ATM. So um, these are the things that the, the, the NPSD and also the industry are focusing on to show that there is um, interoperability in the current environment. And a typical example of way um, interoperability services consumer is in relation to an ATM. So currently with your card, uh, regardless of who you bank with, you can go to any ATM and withdraw funds. So that is a, a typical example of um, interoperability. So in relation to Vision 2025, the SAP has a Vision 2025 implementation plan. Um, so it's a, a plan where it involves the SAP, um, other regulators, as well as the industry where there are various initiatives and uh, deadlines on um, achieving specific uh, strategies. So there is a, a payments council that is responsible for monitoring this process. So there is ongoing work um, regarding this. So in relation to how we regulate the national payment system, so there are two acts. The first one is the South African Reserve Bank Act in terms of section 10.1c, the South African Reserve Bank is required to perform such functions, implement such rules and procedures, and in general, take such necessary steps as may be necessary to establish and conduct, uh, monitor, regulate, and supervise payment clearing or settlement systems. 
Also, there's the National Payment System Act, which provides for the management, administration, operation, regulation, and supervision of payment clearing and settlement systems in the Republic of South Africa and to provide for connected um, matters. So currently, the, um, the Reserve Bank is in the process of um, reviewing the, the NPS Act. So the NPS Act was reviewed with the objective of examining the robustness and resilience of the national payment system legislative and regulatory framework um, hi and highlighting the uh, shortcomings of the current regulatory and legislative frameworks and making policy proposals aimed at addressing the shortcomings and ensuring appropriate regulation of the NPS in line with international standards and best practice and applicable domestic law. So um, these are some of the drivers of why the NPS Act was uh, reviewed. So in relation to Vision 2025 that I just discussed now, so um, for example, the issue of non-banks not being able to provide payment services which involve pooling of funds. It is advocated in Vision 2025, but currently the legislative, the current legislative framework is restrictive. So um, it needs to be amended to ensure that the Vision 2025 goals are achieved. And in the payments environment, it's an ever evolving, um, changing space. Um, we used to have paper money um, to, that was the only uh, form of payment. Then um, there were checks. And um, then there was card, now it's electric, uh, elect, electronic uh, payments. Now um, everybody's talking about crypto. So it's important that the legislation is also enabling in relation to the current de developments and um, the, the new players, because initially in the payments environment, it was just banks providing the services, but now we are seeing um, non-banks now um, providing services uh, in partnership with banks in relation to services that involve pulling of funds and other um, services which uh, do not involve pulling of funds. And also the increased focus by regulatory authorities on payment services and uh, systems um, regulation, supervision and oversight. So this also links to um, the review of the effectiveness of a payment system management body. Um, so the current um, regulatory model in relation to the NPS, we have the, the Reserve Bank. Then we have, I uh, maybe some of you will be familiar with that, uh, that organization. It's the Payments Association of South Africa, um, PASA. So it's a there's a delegated authority model where PASA is recognized as a payment system management body to regulate, organize, and manage its, its members. So in relation to the regulation of its members, um, PASA authorizes banks to participate in the payments environment. Uh, PASA authorizes um, system operators. So for example, we have BankServe, we have Visa, we have MasterCard from a clearinghouse perspective. Um, the uh, PASA is responsible to authorize them as system operators. PASA is authorized to, um, to authorize, similar to uh, licensing in our space, and also um, third party um, payments uh, providers. So the review of the NPS Act will also um, focus on um, changes we the we be, we believe that licensing should sit with the central bank similar to other um, jurisdictions so the uh, one of the the, the the proposals that I include is that licensing will move to the uh, to the Reserve Bank and we have section 15 of the NPS Act which requires the Reserve Bank to review the NPS Act from time to time and make recommendations to the Minister of Finance. And we have the Twin Peaks model uh, for financial sector um, regulation, as I'd stated earlier, that uh, Twin Peaks, uh, prudential regulation, conduct regulation, and also financial stability. So in the past, um, the SAP uh, is uh, responsible for uh, payments regulation. But however, the conduct uh, piece, um, not enough attention was uh, 
uh, given to the conduct piece. So now with the conduct um, regulatory authority as the financial sector conduct authority is responsible uh, for the conduct of financial institution in relation to um, the financial product. So a payment service is regarded as a financial product. So the uh, financial sector con conduct authority will also have a role in um, the conduct of uh, payment services providers um, in the national payment uh, system. And also there are applicable standards that um, we are adhering to, but they'll also need to be um, embedded in law, such, such as the PFMI, uh, principles for financial markets um, infrastructures. And also in relation to the, uh, there was a 2008 competition uh, commission uh, bank inquiry, and it made um, several recommendations. And one of the recommendations related to um, the opening up of the, the national payment system that, you know, currently it's only banks that are dominating in the space because of the regulatory framework. So it was important that the NPS is um, uh, open so that there could be more competition in the space. So the NPS Act um, is being reviewed to accommodate um, these um, matters that I just raised. And um, the process emanated in a policy paper. Uh, the policy paper was issued jointly by the Reserve Bank and the, the National Treasury. It contained um, 21 um, recommendations, and uh, I believe the uh, break uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 most important um, recommendation, especially for the non banks, it's in relation to the opening up of the payment system. We non banks would be able to provide uh, payment services, which involve a pooling of funds without the need to uh, partner with the bank. And also they'll be allowed to clear. So currently non-banks are allowed to clear um, in the NPS, but they still need a bank to sponsor them. So in the future, a, a non-bank will be able to provide uh, payment services which involve pooling of funds. They'll be able to clear the transactions themselves and they, they'll be able to settle uh, the transactions themselves. So there won't be this current um, dependency on, on banks. And in relation to the um, developments um, in the NPS, so I will start with PayShop. I hope uh, most of us, we have uh, registered um, in relation to PayShop. So uh, PayShop, it's, in, it's an initiative that was um, developed by the industry, but the SAP was there from a um, monitoring and oversight um, perspective. So a few years back, um, the SAP approached the, the industry in relation to the current um, RTC real-time clearing. So currently you can send money uh, with most banks, you can send money to another bank within 60 seconds. But however, um, for you to do that, it's a, it's a very expensive option and most of the banks are not, um, uh, you know, advertising it to their consumers. So consumers are aware of the service and there's been a slow adoption in the service and South Africa was one of the first uh, countries to have, um, you know, faster payments. But compared to the rest of the world, you know, we are lagging behind in terms of um, adoption. So the SAP issued a consultation paper on the review of faster payments. And thereafter, it issued a position paper where it outlined um, what the industry should consider when developing faster payment systems. So uh, PayShop, it's um, another faster payment system. It was launched in March this year. And the, the big banks, the big four banks, are uh, participating, Standard Bank, EPSA, NetBank, and FNB. And the other banks, they'll be going live in, in a few weeks, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, basically, it enables you to send money to another, uh, so 
I bank with Bank A, and I want to send money to uh, someone uh, who banks with Bank B. Um, but however, I only need their uh, uh, the, their cell phone numbers, but the, however, they need to be uh, registered as well. So it's an alias. The alias can be their cell phone number or they can be their email address, um, whatever e um, alias they choose to provide. So it enables um, consumers to send money without necessarily uh, providing their um, uh, their their, um, their account numbers. So, and the, the current uh, time frame is you can send money within uh, 10 seconds. And um, the next um, development is on the domestic card issuing and acquiring. So the SAP issued a directive in the beginning of 2020. And uh, soon in the next few weeks, we'll be issuing a guidance note regarding that. So um, basically the directive prohibits foreign card issuing and acquiring in relation to uh, domestic transactions. So I'll provide a typical um, example. So you would have an e-hailing e service. Um, I want to go to uh, Pretoria. I'm from uh, Johannesburg. It's the domestic service. I'm moving from you know, one city to another city. But however, um, there are instances where that transaction is processed as an international transaction. Um, so the SAP is um, trying to ensure that all domestic transactions adhere to domestic rules, domestic um, legislation. So we are just uh, providing clarity on that. But um, however, there would be there will be some exemptions. For example, if you are um, streaming using um, Netflix, um, you know, it's important that your bank, you know, some of you may be aware, but a lot of people may not be aware that uh, that transaction is an international transaction. So um, firstly, your bank might charge you um, more um, because there's that uh, conversion fee. And then um, the other thing, because it's in rent, consumers, assume that it's a it's a local transaction. So domestic transaction, meanwhile, is an international uh, transaction. Um, but however, the SAP does, does provide um, those exemptions because even though it's a streaming service, you're in South Africa, it's still regarded as an international uh, transaction. So the guidance note um, provides that clarity. And then we have um, daily check. So um, debit check came about as there was abuse in the debit order space. So um, there was that 99 rent scam. So in the past, um, banks, well, most banks, um, never provided their consumers with, in, with a notification if a transaction was below 100 rent. So um, the scammers were um, aware of this and they took advantage of that. So um, especially in the past, people would find that there were, you know, 40 rent debit orders, 60 rent debit orders, uh, 20 rent debit orders, but they were not aware of those debit orders until they went to a, a bank or the head side of their statement and they actually, you know, check their statements. And as you uh, may be aware from your own experience, um, seldom people actually check their statements um, line by line. So in order to curb um, such abuse, the Reserve Bank provided the industry a terms of reference that they needed to come up with a debit order system that was um, safe to, to, to use and also to curb the, the current abuses. So the industry came with um, the concept of debit check. And also the other concept of debit check is in relation to the early debit orders. So um, sometimes if you, uh, you uh, may be away, depending on um, your, your, the, the, your, your service provider, uh, on your payday, come uh, midnight, 
just after midnight, their, your account is already debited. So it's called an early debit order system. It's a random system where um, collectors are provided with an opportunity to debit early versus in um, a typical EFT debit where um, there may not be funds um, in that account. So um, Debbie Check from an, it's an authenticated collection uh, mechanism. So the user actually has to uh, authenticate. So it means that the user is aware and consents to the uh, debit order, unlike before where you are debited and you don't know who's actually um, debiting you. And then um, the other developments is on the... Um, the open banking. So there has been a lot of discussions regarding um, open banking, and not only from the Reserve Bank perspective, but other regulators as well are looking at um, open banking. So open banking has uh, two features. So basically, um, the one feature is um, a consumer um, consenting and permitting a third party to make payment on their behalf. So this will also curb the current uh, challenge um, in relation to screen scraping. So currently there are various uh, options when you make online payment. And one of the payment options is says um, you can make an EFT payment. And with that EFT payment, um, as you go through that uh, EFT payments uh, from, from that website, you think you are actually um, uh, uh, processing that payment yourself, but meanwhile, there is a facilitation of a third party, and that third party has um, access to your username and password. And remember, the banks are always telling their customers, do not give anyone your username and, uh, and password. So um, the customer believes that they are the ones and it's a safe environment. They are making this payment. Meanwhile, it's facilitated by a third party and the third party has access to their, their information. So the SAP issued a consultation paper on uh, open banking and then um, it uh, will address screen scraping for now as an interim measure. But however, the long-term uh, solution is um, APIs and the banks are, are comfortable with that process that um, APIs are much more safer than, uh, than screen scraping. And the, uh, the other option is um, we, you, you, you consent with that party to obtain, for example, if you bank with um, three banks, to um, obtain specific information regarding those uh, three banks. So it's it's important that there is uh, consumer concern where third parties are making um, uh, payments or uh, are providing payment services on behalf of a, a consumer. And the other one is on um, interoperability. So the SAP issued an interoperability um, position paper a few years back that it supports um, interoperability. Yes, it is a way that when um, new innovation starts, it would start in the closed loop space, but it encourages that that should migrate to an interoperable space. So currently the SAP is reviewing the interoperability um, position paper as um, the, the, I think the examples that I mentioned, though, for example, there is no inter interoperability amongst the bank's um, electronic e-wallet type of services. They each have their own um, services, but they are not interoperable because if I am sent money from um, to an FNB e-wallet, I can only withdraw money at an FNB, so I can't go to a capital Western bank. Um, ATM and the other one is on the um, remittance uh, service. So sending money from um, Joburg to to um, Limpopo um, using a, a shop right. And if I send money to my grandmother in Limpopo um, through shop right, if she's close to a pick and pay, 
she can't go to a pick and pay to withdraw that the 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 the, the money. So it's important that there is interoperability within that environment as well. So the SAPO issue, uh, the interoperability consultation paper um, soon. And then um, what is also of interest is the, um, sorry, I'm also uh, timing myself, yeah, is also the issue of the um, IFWG. So the IFWG is the um, Intergovernmental FinTech um, Working Group. It was established in 2016. It's a collaboration of various stakeholders, such as the National Treasury, uh, Financial Intelligence Center, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, the National Credit Regulator, the Reserve Bank, the South African Revenue Service, and the Competition Commission. So the A IFWG was established as a collaborative structure to gain a better insight of the growing role of fintech companies and innovation in the South African financial sector, as well as to explore how regulators may become more proactive in assessing emerging risk and opportunities um, in the market. So, um, so those are basically the, okay, and then there's ISO 2022. So it's a rich messaging um, system. So uh, currently the, the South African Reserve Bank Settlement System uh, went live in upgrading its messaging system to ISO and the industry will implement um, ISO in relation to the new uh, payments um, a system as um, ISO is a, a great messaging system because it allows for, for screening and it does, it's not restrictive in terms of the number of um, characters that could be included. So, sorry, it was just my alarm telling me that uh, my time is up. Thank you very much. Sure, so much to learn. I thank you very much. I do think that there are going to be a couple of follow-up questions for you, Pro. The, the first one for me is on the pay share model, and I think obviously the fact that the transactions can be facilitated within a 10-second period is something that's to be welcomed. But I am quite concerned about the diminished sense of vigilance because now we do know that in spite of the fact that you, you know cell phone companies are supposed to vet us properly before we buy a SIM card through the recall process, that doesn't always happen. Does this then not pose a threat of many people simply buying these unregistered SIM cards, conducting transactions that can be used for the type of nefarious means we saw being mentioned in reports like the FATF? Okay. Uh, 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 Struggling there with the sound, Pearl. Okay, can yes, start again, please. So, if I'm making a pay shop uh, payment to you, right? Um, I bank with FND and you bank with EPSA. Mm. You would also need to register with EPSA if ever I'm going to use, for example, your um, alias cell phone number. So the bank already has registered your proxy. It's called a proxy. But however, I still have an option to use your account. If I do not have your, if you're not registered, I can still use your account number and that transaction will be processed uh, within uh, 10 seconds. So it is safe because um, the, your proxy is loaded with your bank and the bank knows who you are. It doesn't escalate the existing risk profile of our payment system. Um, not necessarily. I think they could be um, because it's a new payment system. So now the transaction limit is 3,000 rand. Um, so the industry is monitoring risk because, you know, with any type of payment, um, you know, there could be uh, fraud. Uh, but the industry is monitoring risk and we are receiving, you know, um, updates, regular updates from the industry. There hasn't been a made major incidents when it comes to um, 
risks because the transactions are low under three thousand rand, and you know the you you know the the person that you are paying. Unlike with, for example, a typical e-wallet, you know, it's you can send it to any cell phone number, and uh, you're not sure if that person just they just got their cell phone number um, today, or it's a fraudulent cell phone number. Unlike with PayShop, we um, the recipient that would also need to register with their bank, register the proxy with their bank. So yeah. about people who've been victims. I've been a victim of it. So the idea of Debbie Check coming through to sort this out is quite welcome for me. But I still have uh, some questions of clarity. Pearl, does this simply mean that all my existing debit orders at some point in time will essentially be frozen until I give an element of consent through Debbie Check? How exactly does it work? So it normally works with new contracts. So with the current David orders, that will still continue as usual. But when you now enter into uh, the new David orders, for example, the new renewal of your insurance, if they want to collect via debit check, so it's not a must that they collect via debit check. So debit check, it, it provides an, a, a, an advantage to the collector because they um, almost guarantee the payment. So um, only with new contracts, um, you would need to um ensure but as consumers it's important that when you receive a mandate so a mandate you would um receive it via your um ussd via your sms or via your banking app so it's important to accept or to reject so um so that the user on the other side is a way that you've accepted and you have rejected because um, the, the information also sits with your bank. So your bank is a way that you are aware of this mandate. Uh, you're happy with this mandate. You accepted this mandate. Therefore, your bank is uh, comfortable that um, a third party would come and debit your account. But if you reject that mandate, then your bank knows that no. Um, it should not allow that party to come in and, and debit money into account. So it's important for um, consumers to also be educated from that perspective. You've been a victim of this? Um, can? Um, can I not comment? <laughs> <laughs> you can confess. <laughs> uh, we'll protect you. There's also, obviously, Pearl, the developments regarding these international transactions that we all engage in on a daily basis, but some of us don't even check that it's an international transaction because, look, it's Uber. It yep. says it's going through my local account. What are the type of risks that the Reserve Bank is trying to manage by simply, um, you know, coming up with this directive on what should happen to those types of transactions? What are we trying to address there? Um, so from a, a cut issue and acquiring perspective, so in terms of the the legislations and the regulations and rules that are in South Africa, there are certain um, requirements um, and certain uh, protections that are afforded to a consumer. And then also it's important that if an international player wants to play in South Africa, it's important that they adhere to South African rules. So it, it will be a challenge for the Reserve Bank to, um, to um, regulate an entity that is not um, abiding by South African rules in terms of uh, providing those services. So it, it is more from a sovereignty perspective to ensure that our domestic uh, transactions are protected and they are not you know, exploited by international companies coming here, doing whatever they want, and they do not adhere to the regulations of South Africa. Um, however, an international company that wants to provide that service in South Africa, um, it's not a problem that would need to be acquired by a South African bank. If they want to issue cards, they would need to issue cards um, in partnership with a South African bank. So um, it's more from a sovereignty perspective to ensure that um, you play in South Africa, you abide by the rules in South Africa, because those rules also protect consumers in South Africa. Thanks. You know, it's, it's actually now dawned on me, sometimes when you dig deep into your Uber invoice or your Netflix invoice, you suddenly see it's registered in the Netherlands and all of those things. I've never really tried to synthesize what the implications of that are, and I suspect these are the type of things that the Reserve Bank is now trying to address in one way or another. Absolutely, Kai. It's interesting work that the Reserve Bank is doing, and it's great to see 
see uh, some of the things that they're coming up with. And for example, I saw that there's a di the discussion regarding pay sharp doesn't necessarily talk to the RICA process, but in the comments, Katrina is actually talking about the concerns with uh, registration of, of SIM cards in the country. And of course, maybe not a question that would be answered by Pearl, but Pearl is also doing some great work in trying to unearth all of these payments that are happening. Yeah, and Pearl, you probably are aware, I mean, a couple of years ago when the Protection of Personal Information Act became the law, a lot of us thought, well, surely with the combination of RICA and Poppy and all these other protections by the information regulator, I'm never going to get this random SMS saying, here's some insurance, buy this and that. But unfortunately, the experiences of many people like Katrina doesn't seem to reflect that there's been a benefit in terms of us being flooded with all these random products we've never signed up for. It is annoying, but I suppose quite more importantly, it is risky. Um, uh, true, but, uh, you know, uh, my mandate is within the uh, the NPS um, and the developments uh, within um, the NPS. But all I can say is that um, in relation to, for example, um, David Orders, it is important that um, banks educate their consumers. And um, in relation to consumer education, the Reserve Bank as well um, is going to start focusing on consumer education because consumers fall prey because they are not aware of their rights and obligation and responsibilities and some of the schemes that are out there. So um, we have realized that um, in the interest of um, ensuring that the payment system is safe, um, it's important that the Reserve Bank starts to embark on consumer education initiatives to um, educate consumers um, regarding um, issues related to payments. And uh, David Orders is definitely going to become one of them. Even though we do educate during the um, Money Smart Week, um, but however, we are developing a strategy to uh, you know, focus on consumer education. We believe that will help with the current issues that are faced by consumers. Thanks. Pearl, uh, we have another question here from Katrina, and, and I think it's an important one and an interesting one. So if you'll indulge us, uh, how is it still possible that fraudsters are able to open bank accounts and there's activity in those bank accounts? And it seems like as a user, there's not much that uh, people can do. And is there anything that is being done to address this by the Reserve Bank or the banks and the industry? So fraud in the banking industry or in the um, electronic uh, payments industry, it's a, it's a challenge um, because if you look at the um, separate states in relation to, um, you know, online fraud, um, card fraud, it is there, but, you know, banks are, you know, doing their best to ensure that, um, you know, measures are in there. So, for example, um, you know, cons with things like phishing. So, um, if you can see that sometimes when you log on into your bank, it will educate you about phishing before you actually start um transacting onto the website. So um, consumers are susceptible to, for example, things like phishing and clicking on links. And if a message says that it comes from a bank, uh, you know, people panic and, um, you know, the bank will say that um, the uh, banking consultant will never ask you for your password. But consumers, um, because someone calls and they say they're from a bank, they assume that, okay, um, it's legit. They provide them with um, their passwords. So consumer education is something that is important because um, with how consumers are susceptible, it's because they are not knowledgeable on how they can uh, protect themselves. Um, fraudsters, fraudsters, they'll always be there. Um, they'll always, uh, you know, come with new tricks and banks will do their best to ensure that they protect consumers. But uh, however, it's important that consumers as well are um, educated as well to ensure that um, they are aware of these fraudsters. For example, when it comes to debit orders, um, 
I know a lot of people, they see a debit in their account. Let's say it's 55 and they're like, ah, oh, you know, these thrusters, it's fine. Meanwhile, they do not know that if it's a debit order that you don't know, you don't, you didn't authorize, you can actually go to your bank and then your bank will credit you that amount and then the bank will do the investigation. So it depends on um, the time period. If it's less than 40 days, you get your money immediately. If it's more than 40 days, um, they will need to investigate, but you will still um, get your money. So those are some of the things that consumers are um, not aware of in terms of their rights and also um, their responsibilities. Because if most consumers way away of their rights and responsibilities, um, they could be um, less fraud. And also these um, fraudsters, they prey on generally consumers who are not, who are vulnerable consumers. So if a um, person calls speaking good English <laughs> to a, a, a mama in the rural areas, you know, they believe, oh my gosh, this person must be from the bank and whatever they need from me, I need to pro provide it to them. Meanwhile, they're not able to assess that, no, there's no way that I should give, you know, another person my pen. So um, consumer education, you know, I will stress over and over again that it's a very important um, factor to curb the various issues that are faced within the payment space. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. But I think it's interesting that we are focusing uh, on the consumer side. And it seems like there's not much being done about the actual fraudster that is opening these accounts and with the bank and the systems uh, pr uh, processing these payments. And it's seemingly... It's it looks, starting to look like we're almost protecting the fraudsters and just saying that the, the consumer needs to be uh, aware. Are we not trying to do anything to protect uh, or to prevent this from occurring? And I do see that we are unfortunately out of time, so you may not have uh, enough time to answer that question. Uh, but I, I, I am interesting to understand, I'm interested, and maybe in the future we'll call you back to understand what is being done regarding the actual fraudster. Uh, that is actually receiving this money, is Kaya? Because I mean, we we take we go through so many hoops just to open bank accounts and yep. do all these things. I have to essentially bring my kidney as proof that I exist. <laughs> and it seems like other people are able to sort of infiltrate the system and then manipulate the system. That yep. for me remains a point of concern. I don't know if you have any closing remarks, Waspo. Um, I, the banks are doing a lot of work. Um, they in terms of, and even the industry as well, in terms of um, catching these fraudsters and also bringing them to book. Um, there's always been, in, you know, also involvement um, with the, um, the law enforcement agencies. So maybe the work is not, um, you know, really public out there in terms of what the banks are doing in relation to fraud, but a lot is being done. Perhaps maybe at the next talk, we could get... Um, uh, fabric or, um, you know, somebody that <laughs> deals with fraud just to uh, provide more information regarding um, what the uh, the industry is um, doing to uh, curb fraud. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much. I think we definitely do need to get and get, engage the services of organizations like Subric and even maybe the banking ombudsman to actually focus on how we can be protected from some of these things because I, I think uh, to put the burden on us as consumers is a bit heavy given how sophisticated the first that have become. I agree. I agree. Kaya, we do need to understand exactly what is being done again to try and prevent um, this from occurring in the first place because I, I, I absolutely agree that must be some education for the consumer, but surely that cannot be what we are focusing on. So I think um, there's a lot of thank yous to you, Pearl. I think we're going to draw to a close now. Uh, thank you again to all our presenters, very insightful presentations. Uh, Pearl, thank you very much and for, for indulging us with those responses. We'll definitely be reaching out to the Reserve Bank for, for more conversations. Okay. And thank you very much for being a wonderful co-host this morning. Members, thank you for participating. And we're going to see you in about four weeks' time for our next in installment of Psychotech Talk. Have a wonderful remainder of the week. Good afternoon.